Thank you, Randy. Hello, everyone. Happy Passover uh, to all of you. Uh, happy holidays uh, to those who celebrate other holidays. Uh, it is wonderful being with you uh, uh, today. We have a wonderful speaker, Professor Dan Chiftan, uh, and uh, as good a moderator, uh, Oli, who will be with us uh, uh, again in a moment. I just want to say that we are really in a world uh, of, uh, of Dickens, of the tale of two cities, the best of times, the worst of times, uh, looking at Israel this week with, on the one hand, revealing a laser anti-missile system. Uh, on the other hand, hearing more and more about the Abraham Accords, even to the extent that the UAE will be sending a representation to Israel's Independence Day celebrations in terms of aircraft. Uh, it's sort of a, a sense of the end of the days that we're in. Uh, but on the other hand, we're in the midst of a very intense wave of terror, which is multidimensional, and I'm sure uh, uh, Professor Shiftan will touch on that in a moment. Of course, the situation in Ukraine is very far, unfortunately, from being over uh, with tremendous humanitarian catastrophe, but also uh, the May 9th deadline of uh, the Russian Victory Day that is coming up, which some, it gives us some structure and some framing of, of where we are. Uh, but there's much to discuss about the very uh, dynamic uh, events around us as history is playing itself out. Uh, and I want to now uh, turn to uh, uh, Ori, but just tell you before we do, we begin the program, that the work of LNET could never be more important than it is today. Uh, that the European countries are reaching out to Israel. Uh, Israel now is uh, uh, reaching also out to, to Europe, whether it's humanitarian work in Eastern Europe, or uh, working on national security issues with uh, other countries in Europe. Now is the time to pay attention, to support this network, and we'll hear much more about that in the hour ahead. Uh, Ori, the floor is yours. Happy holiday again. Thank you so much, and hi to everyone in Chag Sameach. Today's lecture, I have lots of anticipation for this lecture because I have the privilege and the honor uh, that our guest today is my teacher and my friend, Dr. Dan Shiftan. If I can say, uh, you know, as a scholar, if I can say that I learn a lot from uh, very smart people, I think that our guest today is the smartest of everyone in a personal level. Oh, I agree. Level. I agree. <laughs> I really agree. So before uh, Dan will start, I want to introduce him. His great resume, Dan, Dr. Dan Shiftan, is the head of the International Graduate Program in National Security at the University of Haifa, the director of the National Security Studies Center at the university from 2008 to 2018, a visiting professor between 2012 and 2014 at the Department of Government at the Georgetown University in Washington, DC, and a lecturer at the Israel Defense Forces National Defense College, for the last four decades, he has been a consultant to Israeli decision makers and to the top echelon of Israel's prime minister's office, foreign ministry, defense ministry, the IDF, and the National Security Council. Since the mid 1970s, Dr. Shiftan has been briefing members and staffers of the US Congress, as well as top professionals and key political appointers, appointees in the executive branch. In Europe, he has been briefing ministers, parliamentarians, political leaders, senior officers, defense and intelligence officials, and government advisors. He regularly lectures at leading universities, research centers, and think tanks in the United States, Europe, and East Asia, and is a regular source and interviewee on the Middle East for major media in Israel, the Arab world, Europe, and North America. Dr. Shiftan has published extensively on contemporary Middle Eastern history with emphasis on Arab-Israeli relations, inter-Arab politics, and American policy in the Middle East. His books cover a widely variety of topics, our Jordanian option, Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinians, attrition, Egypt post-war political strategy between 1967 and 1970, disengagement, Israel and the Palestinian entity, this last, his last book, Advocating Unilateral Disengagement, 
has a considerable effect on Israeli policymakers. This book from 1999, um, Disengagement. And another book, Palestinians in Israel, The Arab Minority and the Jewish State, published in um, 2011. And the Arab Israeli Reader, a documentary history of the Middle East conflict, co edited with uh, Walter Laquer from 2016. And Dr. Shiftan's most recent book is Israel's National Objectives, a Comprehensive Perspective, published last year. Thank you, Dan. How are you today? I'm fine. And what is more important, Israel is in a very good position. Let me discuss today, if I may, primarily perceptions. And here is an interesting dialogue constantly happening between reality and perceptions. We've had some important changes in reality that had an enormous effect on perceptions. And these perceptions have in turn major impact on the reality of the Middle East, of the world in general, but particularly what we will be focusing on today is on the Middle East. And let me discuss it on three different levels, on the global level, on the regional level, and the domestic Israeli level. On the global level, of course, the dramatic event is the war in the Ukraine. And I think it will be considered as one of the most important historical events, even if you go back for a few decades and a few decades ahead, this would be considered one of the most important events in the beginning of the 21st century, even when we look at it at a historic perspective. And the most important part is not what is happening in Ukraine itself. There is a human tragedy there, and I hope it will be over as soon as possible but the impact on European perceptions. And this is dramatic. What we've seen in Europe since the Second World War and particularly after the collapse of the Soviet Union was a perception where people found it difficult to realize that there is actually an enemy and there is actually evil. I mean, we believed, many of us believed that what is happening uh, as a result of globalization and interdependence is that there is a dynamic where even forces that are not democratic and not open societies will gradually adjust themselves to the enormous benefits of this global world with its interdependence. And the kind of wars that used to be in the past are just, you know, that they're just memories of a terrible past, but they cannot happen again. People speaking about war were told that this is an anachronism. It cannot happen again. The old kind of wars, the kind of war we are actually seeing in Ukraine today, this is an anachronism. Yes, we have confrontations. Yes, we have wars, but these are very different. And what we have seen is that all this perception of the profound change in the nature of the relations between nations has completely collapsed with what Putin did in uh, the Ukraine. Now, for those of us who took a realistic view on Europe, this was nothing new. Perhaps we were surprised by the magnitude, but for Europeans who detached themselves from reality, who denied reality, this is a dramatic change. And I think Europeans have taken too seriously what they have chosen as their uh, anthem of the European Union. Now they've only adopted the music, not the libretto of the uh, Ode to Joy of uh, the end of the Ninth uh, uh, Symphony, but I think they've also attached themselves somewhat to the libretto. This idea is that everybody is just, all creatures drink joy from the breasts of nature, all good people and all evil people, they must follow the uh, path that this joy leads us. This kind of perception that was very popular among European elites, of course, not all of them, but many of them determined the way we looked at the world. 
journalists, academics, people in the arts, people who were telling us about the world. And they were saying, look at us, Europe, we have, and this is true, transformed the slaughterhouse into a continent of peace and uh, freedom. And the world is going th in this direction. And other people now have the benefit of joining our way of life. How could they possibly uh, reject it? And this completely distorted the European perception of the world. I mean, I, I'm calling Europe for a very long period. I'm calling it La La Land, not because all Europeans come from there, but a lot of the European elites have adopted a La La Land perception of the world. And when they came to speak about the Middle East, it was nothing less than ridiculous. I mean, they completely misunderstood the reality and made themselves totally irrelevant by coming up with concepts that couldn't possibly hold water in the Middle East. By the way, we were stupid enough in the beginning of the 90s to adopt such an attitude with the Oslo process. And of course, it inevitably collapsed because it was not anchored in the reality of the Middle East. And now Europeans, through shock treatment, because probably nothing else would have worked, we have a tremendous change in Europe most importantly, the change in Germany. What we have in Germany is more than doubling the defense uh, budget. What we have is an understanding that the way to deal with problems is very often with weapons and not with the dialogue or engagement or any other euphemism for um, appeasement. So when you're confronted with a barbarian, like Putin, with an enemy like Putin representing evil as this war represents, the only way is to confront it with force. Now, the Europeans themselves are not going to fight except the Ukrainians, but the Europeans at least understand not only the legitimacy of fighting, but also the absolute necessity of fighting. And they're willing to help with the fighting, at least with supply of weapons and uh, creating conditions that will make their use more effective. And this is dramatic. This change in Europe, where even the European Union speaks about the supply of weapons is very, very dramatic because it is not only a recognition that you can have evil, but also the understanding that if you want to understand the world, you must focus on cultural distinctions between because different nations have different cultures and their behavior is determined primarily by their culture. So if until recently it was totally and, and I uh, experienced it personally, it was totally illegitimate to say that a certain culture is aggressive and violent, because if you say so, you must be a racist. I think now people in Europe can understand much better that when you are confronted with a very violent culture, like the, the culture in the Middle East, with a culture that is not focused on any constructive instinct, but on the attempt to force your way on your neighbor and to break your neighbor just because he's weaker and you do it because you can, because he's too weak to resist. If you don't understand that culture is the most important determinant of human behavior, if you're afraid to discuss culture, if you deny culture because you cannot deal with it and you call it racism, then you simply don't understand the world. And the Europeans got a wake-up call, also in another context, namely their analytical approach was determined by their ideological commitment. In other words, they came to the Middle East and they spoke about peace in the Middle East and they meant peace between Israelis and the Palestinians, as if the Palestinians matter. Their significance in the Middle East can be digitally described, zero, nothing. Not only does it not determine everything, it determines nothing. It has no impact whatsoever about what is happening in Iran and in Turkey and in Saudi Arabia and in Egypt and in the Middle East in general. So this misperception, distorted, ideologically distorted 
analytical misperception of the Palestinians being the core of everything and the crux and the linchpin and what have it, again, people now can see it in perspective. So what the Europeans are witnessing in their own continent has an impact on the Middle East. There is, an e there is evil, there are old wars, it's not an anachronism. Dy the dynamic of um, globalism can work and it does work, but it doesn't have to work. In other words, it's an option. And the question, some nations take it and others don't. The South Koreans take it, the Palestinians don't. The Singaporeans uh, embrace it, the Arabs don't, or at least most of the Arabs don't. So it's an option, but it doesn't have to uh, happen. There is no substitute to self-defense. You cannot uh, stop defending yourself, rely on the Americans to come and fight for you, and blame the Americans for being the kind of people that will come to fight for you because actually you even exist thanks to the Americans and then you have the chutzpah to come to them and to criticize them for being too aggressive here or there. Now, can they make mistakes? Yes, they make mistakes. They make a lot of mistakes, but their mistakes is not the use of force, perhaps where they use force and how they use force. But if you want to abstain from using force, if you believe that you can deal in everything with, on, with a dialogue, it simply doesn't work. And for Israel, I think it is important because finally the Europeans can, if they want, have some empathy with the Israelis because we are given for 150 years, we are under the kind of attack that the Ukrainians are on today, not in terms of the magnitude of the war, but in terms of the fact that we have an everlasting war of the Arab environment that until recently covered large parts of the Middle East. Now it is focused more on the radicals, but when you're confronted with this kind of war and with this kind of evil, first you have to defend yourself then you can be nice. First, you Europeans can have an empathy with a nation that constantly lives under threat. Then you can point at the, at the imperfections of Israel. Now, is this something Europe, that will change all Europeans? I don't think that progressives will be impressed. Progressives lives in, live in their own La La Land and they're not impressed by reality and I don't think that they, they will change. But most others, I think, will, certainly governments, and not only can you learn from the situation of Israel, you can also learn from all, what Israel is doing. And if the Europeans are uh, willing to defend themselves, there is nowhere else on earth where they can learn more and I hope also purchase weapons because I wanted to help the Israeli economy. You can't learn anywhere more than in Israel. And by the way, what you can learn more than anything else is the unique Israeli uh, combination between being Sparta vis-a-vis -vis your enemies and Athens inside. This is one of the mo most important national objectives that I'm speaking about in my new book, that Israel succeeded being at the same time very tough against its enemies when Israel had to be. And when you have to be tough, you better be meaner than, than a junkyard dog. And at the same time, to your own people, to your friends, to the members of the open society system and democracies, you can be Athens. Now, the Arabs have failed because there's Sparta also inside. The Europeans are inadequate because they tried to be Athens vis-a-vis -vis Putin. Israel has this unique combination and the Europeans can learn from Israel, not only tactics of war, but how an open society defends itself. So that's on the global level. Let us say something on the regional level that actually supports 
what is happening on the global level and from an Israeli point of view, the combination of what is happening on the global and regional level is tremendously important. In Israel, we have a situation where, again, a change of reality changed perception and the change of perception is dramatically changing the reality. The reality that has changed is a recognition of the Arab world, of Arab states, particularly after the dismal failure of the Arab Spring concerning Arab weakness. For the first time in a very, very long time, Arabs are fully aware of the extent of their fragility, not just the regimes, the society, the state. Arabs recognize that they have failed to build something in the last 100 years more than ever before. And they recognize that they are weak, the Iranians are strong, the Iranians have an imperial uh, instinct, an imperial design concerning the region. They want to hegemonize the region. They're frightened. And what they recognize is not only their own weakness, and the strengths of Iran, they also recognize the unbelievable detachment of the United States, particularly under Obama and Biden, from the realities in the Middle East. They realize, practically all of them realize, that whereas you cannot do without the Americans, on the other hand, you cannot trust the Americans because the Americans have adopted a policy that Obama brought to its peak and Biden is now developing of helping their worst enemies and undermining their allies. And this is what they're doing in the Middle East. The United States is basically banking on the Iranians and undermining not only Israel, but Saudi Arabia and Egypt and, uh, and Jordan and Morocco and every ally of the United States in the Middle East is undermined because the Americans have this fantasy, their own la la land, that if they treat the Iranians nicely, Iran will be anything less than the menace that it is today. And I cannot think of a more counterproductive American policy, but this is not what I'm discussing here. What I'm discussing here is the Arab perception of the American profoundly distorted, wrong, and counterproductive policy. So even if I'm wrong, and I'm not, but even if I'm wrong about American policy, I'm certainly not wrong about Arab perception of American policy. And here is the unique combination that changed the Middle East in terms of a perception that changed dramatically as a result of the recognition of Arab weakness, the recognition of Iranian strengths and the recognition of American counterproductiveness in the region. And the conclusion is the only thing we can trust are the Israelis. And what we have today is a reality in the Middle East that is dramatically different than what we've had for a very long time, where instead of having Israel and the Arabs, and America has to choose between them. We have Israel and the Arabs in a coalition that to a very large extent is led by Israel. So the Americans don't have to make a choice. They can have Israel and the Arabs on the same side if they don't insist on capitulating to the Iranians. Here is another interesting thing. For as long as I can remember myself, I al always had to discuss in Washington the difference between rely on Israel where you're good allies and you need oil and you need money. For the first time, Israel, oil and money are on the same side. I'm, I'm sure somebody can make an anti-Semitic joke out of it and I'll, I hope I will come up with one in a moment. But here is the interesting thing. You want the Middle East oil, work with Israel because Israel works with Saudi Arabia. More importantly, Saudi Arabia works with Israel, okay? So the oil, the gas, the money, the Arab support, the Arab markets, everything. 
the overwhelming majority is on the Israeli side. And unless you're hooked on the Iranians for reasons that I can't understand, then don't be as dumb as Eisenhower was in 1956. Be as smart as Nixon and Kissinger were in the 1970s. Namely, do what is good for America, not what is good for some fantasy that somebody cooked up and you can't even make sense out of it if you look at the strategic picture. You can make a lot of sense if you look at the operative tactical picture, yes, but not if you look at the uh, strategic picture. So this is dramatically different because Israel is now a fully fledged regional power. Namely, we are not only a power in terms of our military strengths and economical capabilities, also in terms of our maneuverability, of our political clout in the region. You can't do anything in the Middle East without Israel. Now, Obama had this ridiculous perception, you can't do anything in the Middle East without the Palestinians. And this is really ridiculous. I mean, it is one of the low points of strategic thinking that I can possibly imagine. If you look at the Middle East today, you want to speak to the Saudis, do it through the Israelis, because the Saudis trust the Israelis more than they trust you. So you have here a situation where the Egyptians, the Jordanians, they may criticize Israel because of Al-Aqsa and whatever. This means nothing. It, the, the significance of it is exactly zero. It means nothing, absolutely nothing. If you look at the strategic picture of the Middle East, this is the situation. And also for the Europeans, you know, sometimes the Europeans wanted an excuse to be anti-Israeli so they could say it's because of oil and because of money and so now if you again whatever you want in the middle east work with israel now will israelis listen to you yes i mean you did the most important thing that any uh, culture has done in modern times namely turning europe from a slaughterhouse to a continent of uh, peace and and welfare but if you want to give us advice how to deal with the Middle East by being nice to our enemies, we simply can't take you seriously. And I think the Europeans will also understand that. Last, at the end of my presentation, I want to speak very shortly about a realism that is happening in Israeli society because we also have things that we are trying to deny. And recently, we had a change in terms of our perception vis-a-vis -vis Israeli citizens who are Arab, the Arab citizens of Israel. After what happened in May, a year ago, where Arabs were rioting against Jews because they believed that they can do it. And the problem is not with the thousands who behaved like barbarians, the problem is with the post factum legitimacy of it, of Arab leadership in Israel, to the barbarism of Israeli Arabs in May um, 2021. And here is an interesting thing. Say I'm wrong about the reality. Again, I'm not. But say I'm wrong about the reality, about the perception we have in public opinion polls, Israelis in Israel, Jews and Arabs alike, saying in the next confrontation, Arabs in Israel will act against Jews. We have Arabs and Jews saying there will be more violence in the next confrontation than we had in May. And in a way, I think understanding it is a good thing. The reality is negative, but the realism of recognizing this reality is important. By the way, the IDF is already preparing battalions to deal with what might happen in times of war if Israeli Arabs will um, be helping the other side. So in the army, we have already learned the lessons of May uh, 21. 
Let me conclude by saying the following. What happened on all three fronts recently is terrible. The human tragedy in the Ukraine, the um, American policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran, and what happened with uh, Arab citizens of Israel. But the lessons from it, the change in perception is very positive. So we have on the one hand, a negative wake up call from a reality that was bad and now it got worse. But since we recognize that the challenge exists, perhaps we can deal with it more effectively than in the past. I think I've uh, had, I, I've given you enough provocation to start the Q&A now or whatever Ori wants uh, to do now. So thank you and let me stop here. Okay, thank you so much, Dan. Always, it's a pleasure and very interesting, you know. Um, a question that I want to ask, and I think many others will probably be interesting with, what do you think in relating uh, also, you discuss a lot uh, eternal uh, situation in Israel, with, we discussed it also last week with Dr. Kobe Michael about uh, the intervention of Hamas in uh, the last conflict. Also, they tried to inspire uh, uh, terror attacks from inside Israel. Um, how do you relate it to, let's say, the unstable political situation in Israel? What is your comment on that? How do you perceive uh, the situation right now? In Israel? First of all, uh, let me, in case I was too optimistic in my first part, let me say the following. Your grand-grand-grandchildren will fight in Gaza. Because what we have in Gaza are barbarians. I mean, these guys who get billions of dollars, I mean, per capita, they got 10 times as much as the Europeans got in the Marshall Plan. They could have made Gaza into a blooming place. Uh, Shimon Peres, that he was always wrong about everything, said, the moment we leave Gaza, it will become Singapore. Okay, they had the opportunity to make Singapore out of Gaza, and they made Gaza out of Gaza because they don't care about the future of their children. And I'm not speaking about the leadership. I'm not speaking about Hamas. I'm speaking about the society. Remember, they were democratically elected, and I guess that if they would have had democratic elections today, they would have elected the same people. So there is no solution to what we have in Gaza. From time to time, we will have to hit them. And I don't think there is a solution there. Anybody who offers a solution lives in La La Land. Now, do we have a problem that they have taken um, uh, custody uh, over Al-Aqsa? Yes, but we are making a mistake, making it easier for them. We allowed our commitment to the son of Sisi for Hamas to um, release the people who were taken to custody after their um, uh, barbaric riots in the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And we help them in a situation where they can keep Gaza quiet because at the moment it is convenient for them and they can flare up the West Bank. We should not allow them to do it. We should, whatever they want, we must do the opposite. Because what they want is to make war. They, they only want to rebuild their military capabilities so that they can make better war with us. We should not be um, committed to tranquility today if it brings a bigger eruption tomorrow. Now, is that something that the present government is to blame for? No. Netanyahu did the same. All Israeli governments did the same. And I think all Israeli governments are wrong on this. Look, let me say something that may sound strange. 
the Israeli society is so strong, we, we can survive with any government. Okay, I think we've proven it in the last uh, years. Whatever government you have here, the strength of Israel doesn't come from the government. Now, is it better to have a good government than to have a bad government? Yes. Will people in Israel disagree about what's a good government? Yes. But look at the Israeli economy and look at the tremendous success of Israeli economy with the previous government and with the present government. Look at the fact that when it comes to Iran, there is total unanimity in Israel, regardless if you support the previous government or this government. Is there anybody in Israel who seriously believe we can make peace with the Palestinians? No. Is there anybody in Israel who believes there is a solution to Gaza? No, very few. Very few people who are out of touch with, um, with reality. So is there a major difference in Israel between left and right? No, because look, in this government, you have the deep left and the deep right, okay? And they can work together. And were it not for the personality of Netanyahu, which is at the moment the problem that the right in Israel cannot all live with, we could have had a government in Israel today encompassing most of the parties in the parliament with a 75, 80 out of 120 in the coalition very easily, because when it comes to the subject matter itself, there is no major difference. And by the way, this is good news. In America, you have a cold civil war between two camps. In Israel, we shout at each other and we hate each other, but we work with each other and we speak with each other. Now, we enjoy cursing each other, it's fun, but we don't have this divide. You know, I recently spoke to a senator, a friend of mine in the US Senate, and I suggested that the United States adopt a two-state solution, a democratic state and a Republican state. We don't have in Israel this situation. In Israel, we, everybody wants to be in power. Whoever is not in power says that the other one is a threat to democracy and nobody is taking either too seriously. So no, I don't think it has an effect, not a major effect. Okay, another question before we let the audience, there are several uh, people who raise their hands, we let them ask the questions, but another question, let's move on to the war in Ukraine. How do you, let's say, perceive the Israeli um, actions, um, let's say maneuvering between uh, Russia and Ukraine? What is the grade that you give uh, the Israeli government in that matter? I think this government is doing the, the right thing and another government would have done something very, very similar. Look, on the one hand, uh, if we speak more strongly against the Russians in the Ukraine, it won't make any difference whatsoever. I mean, it will make some of us feel better. It will make me feel better. But so what? The impact of it is zero. On the other hand, we have Russia on our northern border and they can make our most important objective, namely hitting the Iranians, very difficult. So particularly when the Americans are not helping, in other words, by trying to get back to the JCPOA, they're actually undermining what is necessary for Israel. Do I want the Russians undermining it in a different way? I mean, the Americans undermining it politically and the, and the Russians undermining it militarily? No, there is too much at stake on the one hand and nothing at stake on the other hand. So I think that what this government is doing is very good. And another government, even if it would not be as good, it would be somewhat less good, somewhat better. The difference is not significant. Any government would have done the same. Thank you, Dan. Um, Margie, the floor is yours. You're muted, so. Uh, Margie, we can't hear you, you're muted. Will you please unmute yourself? Just press the mute button, Margie, 
and then we can all hear your question. On the left side, on the left side, on the bottom. Maybe I can do it. No, I, I can't. I cannot also. Randy, can you unmute Margie, please? I've asked and I guess she, she's not unmuted. Maybe go to the next question and maybe she can put it in the chat. You know what? I will unmute everybody. Can I do that? No, I don't think you can, but let's move. Uh, no worries, uh, Margie. We'll let you ask the question. Uh, Melvin, please, your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. loud and clear. Yeah, hi. Um, can, can you elaborate on the strategy of dealing with uh, a possible Arab fifth column, which you uh, intimated with the uh, IDF were dealing with in a, in a possible new war? Well, let me put it this way. Arabs in Israel are in a dissonance that is very, very difficult to understand if you don't know the dissonance many Arabs are in beyond uh, Israel. On the one hand, they realize that everything that is good about their life is a product of the fact that they don't live in an Arab state, but in a Jewish state. On the same hand, they realize that the Arabs, the Arab world is an unbelievable failure, perhaps the worst failure in modern times. And on the same hand, again, they want to integrate in Israel because it is economically beneficial for them. It is beneficial in terms of this, their uh, quality of life. So they realize that they have an opportunity here that no Arab has anywhere, certainly not in the Middle East. On the other hand, they have this distorted sense of national honor where you feel good about yourself if you don't give up, if you don't what you call capitulate. Namely, you continue to fight against Israel and against the legitimacy of Israel. And remember, they are culturally under the effect of the Arab world and the Palestinians, where they constantly have their own leaders and everybody around them telling them that the very existence of a Jewish state is illegitimate. And this is an Arab land and the Arabism of it needs to be restored. So they live in a dissonance where at the same time, it is not as if one of the things is the true reality and the other thing is make-believe. Both are real. On the one hand, they don't want to get into confrontation with Israel. And on the other way, they cannot do but to elect leaders who question the very legitimacy of Israel and constantly identify with anything that is bad for Israel and constantly identify with and legitimize terrorism at the same time. Now, this reflects itself in the Arab leadership. The same people who want to integrate in Israel elect the kind of leadership that rejects integration. We have now a very unique exception, and this is Mansour Abbas, and he is honestly trying to take a different approach. But the question is, does he have the support of his electorate? And does, it ha does he have the support of the people who are working with him in parliament? And unfortunately, this is very shaky. And the majority of Arabs in Israel still vote for parties who are anti-Israeli with even anti-Semitic elements in it, with support of terrorism and a repulsive way of trying to criticize Israel for not being democratic enough while they support Assad and Arafat and Hamas and what have you. So it is something that is very often repulsive more than anything else. Now, a small minority of them riot 
And the problem is not the small minority, because if the small minority would have rioted and that's it, we have our own small minority of, of hooligans in Israel, okay, in Jews. But the problem is that you have the leaders of this community legitimize this barbarism. So when the head of the follow-up committee, Mohammed Barakir, says to the people who had pogroms in Lod and in Akko, you are bringing back uh, Lod and Akko to Palestine because it was taken away from Palestine and this is what you're doing, then you have a very serious problem. If in Um el Fahim, when you have two barbarians who murder two Israeli policemen on Temple Mount, by the way, Druze Arab, uh, Druze Israeli policemen, then their funeral becomes an expression of identification with terrorism. Every time a terrorist gets out of jail, he becomes a celebrity. Do most Arabs want it deep in their heart? No. And am I interested in their heart? Am I a cardiologist? No, I'm not a cardiologist. I'm not interested in what's happening in people's hearts. I'm interested in their behavior and the way they behave brings up the justified concern in Israel that what we have already seen in October 2000, and we have already seen worse in May 2021, will happen again. And when we ask Israeli, Arab public, Israeli public opinion and Arab public opinion in Israel, they say it will be worse. So that's where my concern comes from. What about the strategy, the idea of strategy that you alluded to of dealing Look, with this? Basically, the strategy of the IDF is justified and, and effective when it comes to military actions, but the army wants to buy tranquility and it buys tranquility at the price that is unacceptable. Even if we avoided the confrontation with Hamas by releasing the detainees from the Temple Mount, I think it was a mistake. Because if you strengthen this, it motivates them to do it for the next time. Because the way is to make Hamas irrelevant. You want from time to time to hit us and we will hit you a hundred times more, go ahead. The moment they can stir up more things and it works, the long-term effects are negative. So when the army deals with it militarily, I think it deals with it well. When the politicians give them the green light to bring more Arab workers into Israel, to make closer the, the contacts between the West Bank and Israel, the Gaza Strip, and Israel, I think it's a major mistake, but I must admit some of my criticism is rooted in my political opinion. I want to unilaterally disengage from the West Bank and I supported the unilateral disengagement from the Gaza Strip. People who want to stay there forever want to live together with millions of Palestinians and uh, for them it is not counterproductive. For me, it is counterproductive. I think it's a mistake, but anyway, never try to buy immediate alleviation at the cost of strategic um, uh, calamity later. Paul Wilder, please, your question. Dr. Shuften, <clears throat> first of all, thank you. Uh, you and my thinking are amazingly aligned. You must be brilliant. Uh, well, I'm certainly more handsome, but not more brilliant. <laughs> you know, I want to bring everything that we've said down to basics because that's really where it lies. The basic is number one, self-determination and survival, period, end of story. Secondly, I am ashamed of decisions made, especially in America where I am. And I'm not sure what the sickness is that is pervading the left and the right and the this and the that. 
we are somehow swayed. So we need to be better at that. But I wanted to say with regards to the enemies, which are numerous with Israel, and I have to tell you, I may sound arrogant, and that's okay. I think the world, or much of it, is jealous of us, what we're able to do, our development, our strategic uh, 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 prowess, everything about it. You know, we do more for the world than I think any other country. Look, the U.S. is there with aid, and but it, it, it somehow gets splattered. You know, I want to say one thing with regards to radical Islam only. It will not change. It cannot change. Or like one of my one of my daughters, who's more brilliant than I, he said, Abba, the stripes of a zebra can only go one way. And so you have such ignorance, and I don't mean stupidity, I mean ignorance, that you're right. Uh, I think uh, it, it, it's not solvable clearly with Gaza uh, or the West Bank. I don't know what the answer is. We need to stay the course. We need to do what we Jews have been doing for 3,000 years. And at the same time, be a light unto the nations. And I, I pray that that um, enlightenment will bring people towards us. You know, we're dealing with something, well, we're dealing with two things, and I'll end with this. We're dealing with two grotesque factors of human nature, greed, greed and ego, none of which will supply the answer. So our talks, our communication is critical. But on the other hand, like you said, doctor, our survival is necessary in any matter uh, and in any form. And I only pray that true democracy creeps into everybody else's uh, uh, mind process. Europe, I'm ashamed of. You know, it's like there's a lot of talk, but a whole lot of lack of courage. But in the end, I'm hopeful as we have always been. I thank you for allowing me my, my words. Thank you, Let thank me you both. Respond on two on two points. Uh, first of all, I can identify what the American malaise is. It is a terminal case of optimism. In other words, Americans assume that in every Saddam Hussein, there is a little Thomas Jefferson trying to come out, only he had a difficult childhood and we must help him. Okay, and interestingly enough, this goes for the West, for the right and the left. I mean, the idea that you can bring uh, democracy to Iraq or women's rights to Afghanistan is about the most ridiculous thing that I can possibly imagine. I, I spoke at the Pentagon in 2002 and I said to them, if you want to bring uh, democracy to Iraq, try first to bring Gemütlichkeit to Israel. And since they didn't know the term in German, I said, if you can persuade Israelis to become patient, you can persuade the Iraqis to become democratic or, okay. or, the, or the Afghans to become, um, uh, uh, to, to, be, to have an equal attitude for men and women. Concerning the contribution of uh, the Jews and America, there is one thing that we all tend to forget. Were it not for America, all of us would have lived under the Hitlers and the Stalins of the time America saved all of us, and if we live in freedom, it is thanks to America more than anything else. So I will never be stop. Uh, I will never stop being grateful to this great nation because the the most important thing, the precondition for everything else, human liberty, is to a very large extent thanks to the willingness of Americans to fight for it, even when Europeans were not willing. To, to fight for it. Uh, you may have heard that when they're selling um, a French rifle from the Second World War on eBay, they say that it's in mint condition, never fired, dropped once, okay? So uh, what I'm saying here is that we, with all due respect to our contribution, we would not have survived as a people and as a country 
were it not for the United States leading the democratic world. Now, this does not give people immunity from stupidity, okay? And we are sometimes uh, stupid and America is sometimes stupid and we should try to try and correct it. Ori, you've, you're muted. You're muted. Ori. Sorry, sorry. Yes. yes. Sorry. And last question because we're out of time. I'm very sorry. Paul, thank you so much for your really great speech. I support every word of it. Um, and God bless America. Daniel Dulkelman, please, the last question, and let's make it short. I'm very sorry because we are out of time. Please, Daniel Dulkelman. <clears throat> oh, hi, everyone. Thank you for the speech. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> my question is, uh, oh. I'm here in, here in Los Angeles, quite peaceful here now, but I'd like to know if the IDF is ready to um, actually attack Iran or the nuclear sites as is true, if it's true that what Benny Gantz said that we are almost there, or they are almost there, are we ready to do that? And do we have the bombs to do it? Just from a practical standpoint, you know, we talk a lot about it, but are we ready and, and we have the material to do it? Because last time I heard, we depend on the United States to give us the, the deep bombs to attack. First of all, when we are speaking about the Iranians being almost there, we are speaking only about enrichment. And one of the distortions of public debate, because of the Obama administration and now Biden administration, is that we focus only on enrichment. Uh, unfortunately, the JCPOA came after the Iranians got almost everything they wanted, as far as enrichment is concerned. And now that they have everything, it is not the most important impediment. The most important impediment is weaponization and ballistic missiles. And the Iranians are not there yet because they don't want a, one bomb, they want an arsenal, and they need for that delivery systems and particularly weaponizations. So we have some time. And as Israel has admitted, uh, we have um, neglected for a while preparing for a military strike. And we are working very, very hard now to prepare ourselves for it. It doesn't depend on a special bomb or a special uh, instrument. And also when you attack Iran, there are many modes of attacking Iran. At the moment, remember, we are at war with Iran. It is a low intensity war compared to an all-out war, but it is quite, quite high intensity as low intensity wars go. And at the moment we are doing it systematically. The, I think the United States, if it God forbid reaches an agreement with Iran, the problem is not with the nuclear um, weapon. The problem is that hundreds of billions of dollars will finance the Iranian takeover of the Middle East. And the United States will make Iran, through American stupidity, it will make Iran a dominant power in the Middle East. And this makes war much more likely. And the regional war much more likely. So I suggest at the moment, we don't concentrate on the military preparations. We must do them so that we have it as an option in our toolkit. But this should not be our focus. The focus is how to prevent Iran from being strong and specifically how to prevent the Biden administration from strengthening Iran in a dramatic way that threatens not only Israel, but the whole Middle East. And we have allies here and these are most of the Arab states who are against this American policy. This is today, in my view, the important focus. Thank you. Okay, the last question, thank you. Last question, actually they're quite identical, both people ask. Um, Dan, can you please elaborate uh, on the issue of disengagement from Gaza in brief, because we are already we must finish, but uh, many people in the audience ask these questions about the disengagement from Gaza and 
a disengagement, you know, in uh, in general, as an Israel uh, as an Israeli move toward the, the Palestinians. Let me just close something here because I made it happen at eight o'clock, and I need to see that it doesn't happen. So please bear with me for one second, and then I can. I guess you understand what I'm asking about this engagement. I'm not just yes. talking about the Gaza Strip. I'm no, talking no, mainly no, about no. parts of the West Bank. Yes, yes, yeah. Just you have a, a very. I know. I know that you have a very solid opinion on this, and I think yes, it, I, great audience here will love to hear about it. And okay, then let me close. Okay, let me just uh, say. Let me just say the following. This is not working here. Okay, but I hope it will not be in our way. Let me say the following. There are three options. Peace with the Palestinians, permanent Israeli um, stay, and incorporating millions of Palestinians into Israel, and unilateral steps. These are the three options. There are only three. Peace with the Palestinians has zero possibility, not low possibility, not very low possibility, but zero possibility. It is absolutely impossible because the Palestinians, the essence, everything the Palestinians are about is preventing it. They're unwilling under any circumstances whatsoever to accept the reality of a Jewish state and terminating the conflict in a situation where a Jewish state exists next to a Palestinian state. So the chances are zero. Bringing in 5 million and more Palestinians into, into the state of Israel will destroy Zionism and the state of Israel. And you cannot take the territory without uh, bringing in the population. So, to quote Conan Doyle, when you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So the only thing that, is re that remains are unilateral steps. Will it bring peace? No. Will it stop European criticism and progressive criticism? No, it will probably intensify it. Will, will it, end the conflict with the Palestinians, not even no peace, but even ending the conflict, no. But will it rid Israel from wasting its energy on millions of Palestinians who will just make Israel a poor country that Jews will not want to live in, a primitive country that nobody wants to live in, nobody wants to come to and destroy the entire Zionist project and with it, the future of the Jewish people, the, because the future of the Jewish people depends on um, depends on the Zionist project. And therefore, my only question in Gaza was, will the Israeli society be stronger with Gaza or without Gaza? And the Israeli society is indefinitely stronger without Gaza. And the fact that Israel is so resilient is because we withdrew from Gaza, Israelis understood that even when you withdraw from 100% of what people demand, they still want to kill you. So they understand that the problem is not with Israel or with settlements, it is with the Palestinian national movement. So I think it is a tremendous achievement and a tremendous success in the Gaza Strip. In the West Bank, we cannot do what we did in the Gaza Strip. We cannot give them sovereignty because if we give them sovereignty, they will bring the Iranians 15 miles from Tel Aviv. If we let them have whatever they want, they will destroy their own life in order to, to destroy our life. And therefore we must restrict them. We must impose on them the border that we like. We must disengage and take out our population from the heartland of their land. And if they want to negotiate in two years, in 20 years, or in 200 years, they can negotiate based on the dictate that is not open for discussion 
that here is a Jewish state and it's not open for discussion. And if you even mention the word right of return, we immediately leave the table because your tricks, we've tried these tricks in Oslo and they don't work. Os uh, Olmert gave you the opportunity of getting 100% of the size of the territories the Jordanians and the Egyptians have lost and you rejected it. If you want to destroy us, we won't make it possible for you. And also we will not be contaminated by constantly controlling you for the rest of our lives. This is the logic of unilateralism. And by the way, throughout my discussion today, I try to be objective. Here, I didn't even try. Okay, here, this is my political conviction. So I gave it in, in a way that will be very clear. Then it was a pleasure. It's always great to hear you. And I wish you a great evening in Israel, quiet evening. And I'm turning the floor right now to Lee Rosenblum, National Executive Director. Lee, thank the you, floor Ari. is yours. Thank you, Ari. And thank you, Dr. Schiffman, uh, for your passionate and honest briefing. I think everybody was truly impressed, and I hope you'll be able to join us in the future. Today, we've been talking about evolution, really, and the, the nature of the evolving relationship between Israel, the surrounding Arab countries, and certainly Europe. And when it comes to evolution, I think it was Darwin who probably said it best when he said, it's not the strongest or the smartest that survive, but those which are most adaptable to change. We right. see right. clearly right. how right. countries who embrace Israel have flourished. And we see the countries that haven't and what happened to them. Our mission to educate European policymakers on the advantages of closer relationships with Israel is now more relevant and more important than ever. So we hope that you will continue to support our efforts. Please join us next week when we can continue our series on Ukraine. We'll be bringing Brigadier General Asaf Orion from the Institute for National Security Studies. He will be discussing the China-Russia alliance, how it affects the war in Ukraine, as well as how it affects Israel-Euro relations. Recently, last week, we sent out an appeal to you to help with our efforts in Ukraine. I'd like to give you a short report. 10 days ago, we had 130 professionals on an emergency Zoom briefing from Poland, Ukraine, and Lithuania on a Zoom with Israel's leading trauma expert and probably one of the leading trauma experts in the world, Dr. Eyal Fruchter. On the call were psychologists, therapists, social workers, so that they could learn the Israel experience and translate that into helping on the front lines. We hope you will consider supporting this effort. It goes a long way. As always, please remember, if it's Monday, it's the Elnet Zoom briefing. And with that, I bid you all a good day. כל הכבוד, דן. היה על הכיפאק, תודה רבה. אני שמח, זה היה בסדר גמור. ואני שמח שלא התפרצה לי הטלוויזיה, כי ניסיתי, אני מקווה שזה לא נראה לא בסדר, כי אני תכננתי אותה להיפתח בשמונה. היה נהדר. רנדי, תודה רבה. תודה רבה, חג שמח. חג שמח. אנחנו נדבר, דן. ביי ביי. ביי ביי. ביי ביי. Thank you all. Bye bye.